My name is Lynn, and I'm a partner here at the Space Type Studio in New York City. I'm very excited to talk about generative typography today with you. So as a little bit of an introduction, um, our studio Space Type is a team of two people. Uh, it's, co it's compromised of me, uh, Lynn, and Kevin Ye, who is the other half of Space Type. We do all sorts of work that are letter form related, and we both work in the physical and digital space, and that might mean that we're painting murals one week and then making um, a full-blown digital interactive website the next week. Um, and it's almost hard to explain what we do, but we work on all types of custom letter form projects. We run a retail type foundry, we teach workshops, we make educational resources. Um, we basically do uh, anything and everything related to letters. But today, I'm here to talk about the generative typography work that we do. So here are just a few samples of work um, that I made for generative typography. Um, and if you're not familiar with a term, you can loosely think about it as typography that uh, is generated um, and sometimes is inst instantaneous, sometimes it's more slow and uh, methodical, let's say. Uh, but uh, you can think about it as like an iterative form of typography. And uh, in the context that I'm talking about them, um, all of these were created with code. So like they were using some sort of data. In this case, they were using uh, data from my typeface ampersandist. And because they're made with uh, digital data, we can uh, use the help of the computer to make them in all sorts of different uh, formats, all sort of like compositions, explore the possibilities, um, and uh, and of course like make them interactive in the digital digital space if we wish. And all of this um, could have been done by hand, of course, but uh, it would have taken a long time. So it's a lot faster to be able to uh, generate something with code. Um, of rather than like to be painstakingly like moving them around in like um, a, a some sort of graphic program uh, right and like of course like it's um, sometimes it's in video format like sometimes it's in like some sort of format where it's more static but uh, I often like to create them on the browser. Um, to me, that is their native format. They render live, and that means potentially they can be programmed to do anything that uh, the creator wants it to be. Um, digital type is very malleable. They're very adaptable. And uh, the most simplest um, explanation could be that, like, oh, they can be interactive on a browser, and people could interact with, with their you know, cursors, and like maybe if it's in a physical uh, location, like it could be affected by where they are geographically, or like the time of day, or like even like how much sunlight like a certain uh, spot is getting, right? Like um, the possibilities are really endless. And if that sounds confusing to you, <laughs> I think we should backtrack a little bit and explain a little bit more about how that is possible. And so we have to go back to like the way the computers work. So computers, as mighty as they may seem, um, and some sort of like, you know, like at this like magical black box, on the very basic level, they understand a series of electronic signals. So unlike a person where we can use like hand gestures, like, you know, like, like, yes, no, or like some sort of like sense of common sense, like, oh, like this face means like I'm upset and like that face means I'm surprised. Um, a computer only really knows like digital signals that are on and off or ones and zeros as, um, we like to portray them in, in uh, mainstream media. Like if you like remember like the matrix lines going down or something like that. Um, and so here's a sketch of a desktop computer with like a, some sort of keyboard, a screen, and like a mainframe where like it contains like the brains, <laughs> um, air quotes, um, of you know the brain of the computer. And imagine that you are typing an A on a keyboard. And this all happens almost instantaneously. But you can imagine when uh, you press an A on the keyboard, the keyboard generates a signal. And um, the signal that they create is Unicode. So if you're a type nerd, you might know Unicode as like, it's like this way of encoding um, glyphs. And it's this way that we like tell um, certain glyphs apart. And so like every type of glyph, every type of character, like they all have a special code called Unicode. And in this case, the capital A has the code 65. And so when the key is pressed, um, 
it generates this signal. So like it, it says like 65 to the mainframe and uh, the computer looks up the code point within a font file. So imagine like you're in some sort of like you know, program where you can type like your mail or something like that. And like you have like a certain font selected already. And then like as you're typing, the computer goes like, oh, okay, this person typed an A. And like, let me look up the font file. And we'll look at wherever this um, this uh, 65 code point is. And it goes and looks in that slot. And then it pulls out that outline. And then like, voila, like you like now have the A. Uh, and, you know, as like the font, uh, type that you selected. And if we look into that a little bit further, we can think about letter forms, uh, modern day letter forms um, on the computer as a series of coordinates. And so if you're familiar with um, uh, vector programs such as Adobe Illustrator, you can kind of imagine that like you're like using the pen tool to plot certain points, right? And like, so like you can kind of imagine that each point is like a, uh, a data point, a reference point for your computer to sort of like um, recreate the outline that the designer uh, created. And so you can imagine that if we have this example of this A shape, of this upside, upside down V shape and a crossbar, the computer is like reading the series of instructions. And like, so it's saying, okay, like I go to this first point and then I draw a line from there to the second point. And then I draw a line from there to the third point and so on and so forth. And it goes in a certain order describing what the form looks like. And then of course, like um, sometimes like the, uh, the, uh, the data c contained in the outline will say, okay, like now the shape is done. We need to make another shape that is an addition, um, right? And so like now we have the crossbar, right? And so like all of this is happening instantaneously for us in our computer. But we have to remember that all of these uh, points were like, oh, like we type something and then like now like the signal was generated for a specific Unicode point and then like, oh, like the computer was retrieving these data points and then within these data points, there's a certain order. There's a first point, second point, third point and so forth, um, right? Like all of these data points are something that we can use for generative typography. And so, um, here's just a, var a variety of uh, examples that we've created here at Space Type, and all are made by manipulating data that is pulled from a font file. Uh, for examples, um, if you see like animations that are filling in a certain area, just like right now, the D, um, we might be having the computer scan for negative spaces and positive spaces and being like, oh, like plot a dot if something should be there. And then like, you know, in three seconds, move to a different positive position. Right. And uh, sometimes we might want to make a line look at if it's moving. Um, so here you can see like there's a line going from one point to the next point. And so like we might be like, you know, telling the computer like, oh, find a certain point um, on this outline and move to a different point and move in a certain order. And like now it suddenly looks as if it's like dimensional or moving in space. Um, and it. it I know that this seems like a lot of varied animation that is going on on the screen, but the principles are, um, they're not vast. Like as in like, once you figure out how to do one thing, you can always adapt it to a, to a different types of form. Um, and like, so like moving like the parameters for speed, moving the parameters for color, moving like the parameters for scale, they all create many, many, many different types of animation uh, that makes it feel as if the limitation um, is endless. Right, like I guess, like boundless um, is a better word. Like the only limitation is really your imagination, um, and so yeah. So like sometimes here we simulate physics. Like sometimes we simulate like a lens flare. Like sometimes we. Um, oh, here is a good uh, example where we're um, putting in some sort of data for how heavy a certain dot should be. Um, so that was a U that passed, and here is a W that looks like as if it's dimensional. Uh, because it's like moving as moving in 3D space. It's it's like fake moving in 3D, 3D space, but because of the scale and dimensions, we feel as if it is, right? Um, and here is an example of the Z where like there is just squares that are moving, but it feels as if it's like 3D um, just because of like the optical illusion of the a composition. 
And I'll show you a few more examples of applying algorithms to letter forms, which is a little bit more complex. Um, and these uh, examples that I'm going through are uh, originally made for an essay that lives online. And I won't go through the entire article, but um, I'll walk you through some of the accompanying generative typography. So here we see the word learning, and as someone is touching them, like they sort of like disperse um, into a bird, something like a bird or like fish, in you know when they're moving together in large groups. So like this is called the flocking algorithm, um, and you can imagine that like I brought in a certain font file, and I said like okay, like I'm I want the letters L A R L E A R N I N G, like the word for learning, and then like I want to plot certain points. Um, like little like atoms and then as the mouse touches them um, they can be released into motion right and then like for these parameters like there's now words that are moving around and each of them has a certain attribute like they uh, want to collect together like as if they're you know getting pulled magnetically together sometimes they repel each other like so just like nature and um we can simulate how nature behaves uh, with uh, algorithms. And so here's another one where it simulates how a tree might grow into a confined space. And so in this case, I've um, told the computer like, hey, like I'm gonna plant a seed over here and I want it to fill in into this space, uh, the space of a letter um, that I've given it. And so you can see that like it generates um, into almost like a tree or root or some sort of alien looking form. Um, and in this animation, and it's almost as if like there is like a like a flower and there is some uh, you know like butterflies or bees revolving around the central point of mass. Um, and here's another one where you can kind of imagine like um, there are these points that are you know buzzing with anxiety and then someone hovers over them with a mouse to sort of like say hey it's okay and then like they all gather and they're like a little bit stiller for a second and then like as mo as soon as that goes away they're like ah oh, like they vi <laughs> they vibrate again um, and so like there's all these behaviors um, and uh, if you're used to motion graphics, you probably know all these like, uh, I guess like thoughts around like scale, composition, like the way that um, a certain shape might interact with one another that provokes certain kinds of feelings. And like this is all the same. It's just that like with generative typography uh, and well, I guess more like generative methods, we can create unique compositions that happen and they're, uh, they're not being replicated. And so here, is another example where uh, there's the word communities and all these thoughts are moving around. Uh, they represent uh, people um, in this specific example. And as they come together with communities, they like light up and uh, they hold another person um, when they come around as well. So just like communities like build over time, uh, this composition is building over time. And there is a lot of uh, random factors that go into how these thoughts are moving. So uh, this is a recording of course, but like if you go on the actual website, you'll see that like if you load up the animation like 10 times, they will create 10 different um, compositions like you know like and I'm sure like the thousandth one will be different and so um, there's a lot of possibilities in the way that like um, if you are using generative typography computationally you can make all these different kinds of variations um, and uh, I mean it creates it, it's a it's a lot less effort than the way of doing it like um, in an analog way right and of course, there's a level of control that you are uh, releasing, right? Like I don't have a control. I don't have control over the type of browser someone's using. I don't have the control over what size of browser someone has. Like I don't have control over the speed of internet connections that someone might have. So we have to sort of like relinquish some sort of control. And so it's not going to be the same as if. Um, me making like a static poster and being able to replicate it. And I know that like, even if I mail it over, like, you know, it'll be the same exact poster that I have here, um, right? Like even when it, wherever it ends up after being mailed, like it might be a little bit crumpled, but it's essentially the same um, composition, right? And so like there is a trade-off, but I find it very exciting that, um, that something new is happening each and every time my design is being, uh, you know, brought into motion, let's say. And if you're interested in any of, any of this stuff, I highly recommend that you check out um, Dan Schiffman's YouTube series, like the Coding Train. Like I love the Coding Train series, the Nature of Code series, if you wanna do these like nature-inspired algorithms. Um, really, really cool stuff. 
And uh, just to give you some more, I guess, like real world examples, for the lack of a better word, um, here's a client project that we did. So when you go on this website, you can change the different color. And like there is this question that it, question mark that is presented and you can interact with it. Like the dust particles will like kind of like disperse um, and you can type in a response to a prompt. And when you submit your answer, it'll sort of like all turn into dust. Like turning into dust was what like our our client was like all about. We're like, oh, like I... I want people to know that no matter what we do, we'll all turn into dust. Um, and you know, like that's a pretty cool prompt for someone to get. And so um, we have all these um, processes in place for visitors to create a unique interactive uh, phrase. Um, and so they can, of course, download their unique animation to save, of course. And so you can see like, um, you know, here's some samples that I generated for people to see. Like it asks you, why are we here? And then like if you, t whenever you type in something and then some of your answer will all turn to dust. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have it on a loop. So like it looks like it's coming back together. And so, I mean, maybe there's some sort of poetic thought in that. <laughs> Um, and the great thing about generative type is that uh, you can iterate over multiple different types of animation as well. So here's a staging site that we were using. So we were trying to prototype different kinds of compositions, different kinds of animation behaviors, different kinds of behaviors when someone interacts with it. So here is like, um, you know, like letters kind of blurring out that we didn't really use. Um, and so like there was a chill parameter. So I don't know if it comes across um, here, but like they're all made out of teeny tiny little question marks, right? Like because like that's like the question that we all have, like, why are we here? Um, and so you can see that like, here's a radial um, animation. Here's like a animation where like things were made into like a wave. Like, um, so like all sorts of different things that, that were happening. Uh, but we were able to like test it out like on the spot um, and like show people like what it could be doing, right? And you know, like there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of fun in the process. I guess like that's what I want to like impart. Like there's a lot of fun uh, that happens. And here's a project that's like really fresh off the press, uh, so to speak. Um, this is a very fun project where I was commissioned to make uh, some sort of typographic animation for Panasonic's new campaign. They're an electronics company that you may know. Um, they were they're launching a brand new campaign called Brand New in Japan, and for that they wanted to recruit. Um, many artists to make something with their prompt um, uh, brand new like <laughs> and as um, as a designer as a, as, a, as a creative like often like you always want someone to like give you like some money and be like oh hey like make something cool like the parameters are really open and like this is what happened in this case um, so I just had their new slogan um, and their new lockup called brand new and I was like okay like I'll do something with it and so here you can see like the word brand new like getting uh, twisty like turning into like a 3d uh, composition and then like snapping back into the word brand new like sometimes like it looks as if it's like cut out of paper and then like turning back together um, into one again and then like there's one that oh here where like um they're like getting separated into like multiple different reflections, um, you know, and then like coming back to like snapping back together, like liquid, um, like very exciting stuff. And of course, um, not all of the animation was used, but I'm like very, uh, I'm, I'm just so very happy with how the final, um, uh, advertising turned out there's it's a it turned into a 30 second spot that runs on uh japanese tv and uh it's very exciting like my clip is like one of very 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 um uh talented artist work and, and i'll play it for you here Yeah, like how how nice is that? Like, oh, like there's there's just so many people that participated who have like amazing talent, um, and I'm just you know just so very happy to be a part of it, and I got to get paid to make something cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can't say enough good things. Um, I also. Um, 
I just really love working on that project. And okay, so let's move on. So more recently, we have been exploring variable fonts as a way to create typographic animations. Um, and so, so far, like a lot of the projects that I've been showing you were made with JavaScript. Like we're, we're programming language agnostic. We do often get questions about like, oh, like what kind of programming language should I start with? Like, what should we use? And like, um, sometimes we use Python, sometimes we use JavaScript, like sometimes we use C++. Like we're, we, we just use whatever is, um, suitable for the job, like often like we have to plug in into like some sort of existing framework. Um, but at the core of it, if you know how to program in, in a, a specific language, um, it's pretty easy to pick up a second one. Um, so anyway, like I, I guess I just wanted to talk that through. Um, and without programming, we can do lots of really cool things with variable fonts. Um, and so this is the next section where I try to like um, get you excited about variable fonts. And if you're not familiar with variable fonts, you can loosely think about it as a new font format that lets type designers encode more possibilities. So instead of just having a regular weight a bold way and having like separate font files, you can just have like this design space in there. And if that sounds confusing, like just think about like how calligraphy tools might work. So you can imagine that with different types of calligraphy uh, writing nibs, like you can, uh, calligraphy nibs, you can uh, write different kinds of letters, right? So if you had this like tool that only allowed you to make thin, uh, thin strokes, you would be making like thin outlines. And if you had this tool that allowed you to make a, a high contrast, uh, like of thicks and thins, you would be, you know, you would probably be making letters that had high contrast, right? And so what would happen if designers were able to give you different types of writing tools within one single font file? So like that is what is happening with variable fonts. And if that all sounds a little bit tricky to visualize, um, you can think about the Nord's Eye Cube. Um, if you're interested in type, I'm, I'm sure you have seen it somewhere. Um, the Stroke is a highly influential book written by Nordzai, um, and in the book, uh, there is this diagram uh, that has famously been coined the Nordzai cube. And so if this cube seems a little bit complicated to you, we can think about uh, this as a visual representation of the design space. So we can think about it as, um, uh, an X, Y, Z axis. So like, think about it, like think about like any sort of like 3D tool that you have used and it says like, there, here's the X axis, Y axis and the Z axis, right? It's like in three dimensions. Um, and so the cube shows three different kinds of axes, the contrast type, the diminishing contrast and increasing contrast. So you can equate it to the similar attributes in a physical pen nib. Um, so we can think about like this in terms of weight, like the contrast type and um, uh, the diminishing contrast. So if we think about this, um, we can visualize a design space in a 3D way. So this cube, you have to think about it as if it's a 3D cube, like not like a cube that just has like three sides that appears to be 3D. Um, and of course, an axis can be whatever a designer wants it to be. Like um, I think James Edmondson of Ono Typeco has like a has like a cheesy axis. Um, is that right? Like, and like it's you know like an axis can be like. Um, turning into dust. Like I just made that off the top of my head where like, where like letter forms like turn into dust. Like can it be whatever a designer wants it to be? And it can have more than three, of course. And for me, like uh, in my head, it's hard to imagine a cube that has more than three axes because I exist in the three dimensional space and can't really think about what a fourth dimensional space might look like or like a fifth dimensional space. But a typeface could have all these different axes, right? Um, and so uh, a variable font can give you so many possibilities. And I know that like you've have probably seen like these like whoop whoop animations where like a letter turns from thin to bold um, or like turns from like regular weight to like, you know, like condensed or like extended, right? Uh, but uh, we wanted to create a tool that allows people to animate it. Um, so. This is one of the newest projects that we are running at SpaceType. Um, it's called Vartype. It is a tool that lets you uh, select a variable font that is already in 
uh, the website, or like you can upload a variable font of your own, and it will uh, generate these animations for you, just so you can like test out how your variable font is looking um, in terms of like all these like different kinds of uh, animations. And it's also a, a way for people who don't know variable fonts to know that there's all these different possibilities um, to be using variable fonts with. And so here you can see like you know once you load in or choose a variable font, you can see all these like different kinds of uh, sliders that will allow you to adjust different parameters. Um, uh, for now, we are animating all the parameters for you and you just select like the minimum maximum or, or something to that point. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so you can, you can upload your own file here. Um, I think at this point in time, it's um, here is uh, whoa. Um, and you can see like, like there's so many different kinds of axes. And, and I feel like um, often people are overwhelmed with variable fonts because they need to navigate like all these like sliders and different parameters. And so like our idea was like, what if, what if you give them animation? What if you give people animation so they can see all these different axes in, in, in animation? Um, yeah, and so like that's this is uh, a fresh beta. We are planning to update a lot to it. And so like if you uh, look at it in a couple of months, it might have a lot more functionality. Um, but you know, exciting new tool. So something for you to play around with uh, if you are so interested. And so with that, uh, thank you so much for listening to this talk. And I hope you are excited about generative typography as I am. Thank you.